一番下ですね一番下一番ちっちゃいやつ下のやつです一番手前のやつです앞에있는거큰거우체큰우체아래쪽에있는게아프다체위에있는거작은거맨밑에거요最大的应该是第一排，这个大。<笑>前面的第一个大的是第一排，我感觉还是前面的大的是在第一排啊。对对对对对对对对。Uh, the top one. I hate the top one. Okay, the top one. The top one. The top. The the smallest one. The top one. The、uh, one on top. Top one.、Uh, the one closest to me. The one on the bottom of the page. I'll go with the one at, at the top. I would say this one. This is further away. Leonardo da Vinci's *The Last Supper* is the most famous painting in Western history. It's famous not just for its artistic merit, but also for the interesting perspective of the objects it depicts. This type of perspective is representative of many Western painting styles. In Western culture. Seeing things is highly regarded. Philosopher Rene Descartes believed that human vision was a blessing from God. And perspective is designed to portray the world precisely as the human eye sees it. This type of painting method. Interprets the three-dimensional world into the two-dimensional space using a device like a window frame. With this type of perspective, space can be incorporated onto a coordinate system. In doing this, it becomes objective space. In observation using perspective. The observer is the center, and everything else is an object. The English word "object" can refer to both target of observation and anything. Objective originated from object, means not subjective. Besides its literary meaning. I see is also a stand-in for I understand. This perspective, which originates from the act of seeing, is an important element in understanding the common Western mindset. The act of seeing means the observer is visually sensing objects. The vision of observers is toward objects. And the direction is the front of observers. That's why, in the question asked earlier, which one is ahead? The most distant object from the observer is the farthest ahead.
in that perspective, the nearest is the biggest, and the most distant is the smallest. In traditional Eastern thought, this concept works in an opposite way. This is a traditional Korean folk painting. In this picture, the Western perspective is applied in an opposite way. Here, the nearest is smaller, and the most distant is bigger. This painting method, called retro perspective, is common to Asian paintings. What is the reason this method developed in the East? The concept of Indranet is introduced in the book Avatamska Sutra, a major Buddhist scripture. Indranet refers to the big web said to cover space. This term is a metaphor suggesting that everything in space is part of this network. Clear marbles hang on every knot of the Indranet. These marbles represent every object in space. And each marble contains the images of other marbles around it. The way that marbles contain the images of objects is synonymous with the Chinese letter Jian. Jian means to be seen or to show up. In the West, to see is from the observer's point of view. In the East, to see is an action that comes from objects. In other words, it is not the observer that sees, but the object that shows up. In many cases in Eastern thought, it is the objects that are the center. This is one reason, for example, that Eastern learners of English have difficulty with negative questions. In the East, if asked, don't you like kiwis? You answer yes if you don't like them. Because the question asked about not liking them, the positive response to the question is the right one, which considers the questioner. Therefore, the answer is yes. But in proper English, no is the right answer. In English, I is at the center of most things. If I like, the answer is yes. But if I don't like, the answer is no. In the East, I thinks from the perspective of how others think and speak. Westerners see objects from the speaker's point of view. This is called the insider's perspective, or the first-person perspective. On the other hand, Easterners see themselves from the viewpoint of others. This is called the outsider's perspective, or the third-person perspective. Insider perspective, you know, I, we sort of use that interchangeably with first-person perspective. Um, so it's, it's describing things in terms of what I think and feel and want. And third-person perspective, uh, we use that interchangeably with outsider perspective, that is, uh, experiencing myself the way other people see me. Westerners with an insider's perspective focus on what they think and feel. Therefore, they tend to believe that others feel the same way as they do. This is called egocentric projection. If I thought this person was uh, a great guy, oh, well, of course you thought this person was a great guy. 
if I thought this person was rude and obnoxious, then of course you thought this person was rude and obnoxious. Easterners with an outsider's perspective focus on what others think and feel. They try to imagine what others think and feel. This is known as relational projection. What the Asian American respondents did was they imagined movement through time and space, not from their own perspective, but from the perspective of a friend. So they were sort of embodying the motion of their friend uh, as they imagined these stories. Um, so they felt time and space from the perspective of their friend. The way marble contains images of other marbles is analogous to the Eastern mindset of relational projection. From the opposite viewpoint, what is seen is opposite to my perspective. Therefore, the paintings are portrayed in an opposite way from the viewer's perspective. Korean folk paintings provide examples of this outsider viewpoint. The picture is painted not from the painter's viewpoint, but from the object's viewpoint. That's why, going back to the earlier question, which one is ahead, Easterners tend to answer from the object's viewpoint and say the front one is ahead. This tendency can be found in everyday life. If you go to someone's house here in um, America, it's very often when a guest comes you say, oh, hello, welcome, glad to see you. What would you like to drink? Would you like, would you like um, bottled water with um, gas or plain, or would you like a Coke or a Diet Coke? Um, maybe you want some coffee or maybe tea. Many choices. What would you want? In Japanese context, for example, it's much more common when you go, somebody will think ahead about you. Okay, it's the afternoon, you're probably hot, um, you've come a long way, maybe you would like some iced tea or prepare something for you and offer it to you with the idea that you that would show your connection to the person and your interdependence that you had been thinking about the other person and their situation and you want to try to do the best that you can these differences can be seen in the food cultures between the two regions in the west a chunk of meat is served and people cut it to their preference, so knives and forks are needed at a Western table. In the East, the food is cut by those who prepare the food, so chopsticks are found at an Eastern table. In Western culture, I is at the center of most things. In English, I is even capitalized, no matter where it falls in a sentence. Even the word individual, formed from the negative prefix in and divide, suggests something that can't be divided any further. Individuals are synonymous with atoms that are seen as indivisible and unbreakable into further parts. In Western culture, individuals are often treated as atoms, the basic units of everything. In the United States, uh, the unit we think about is the kind of single person out on um, his or her own, guided by his or her own vision, 
dreams, goals, wishes, desires. And we think about the many situations where, um, you know, what's best for me is not what's best for somebody else uh, or even sometimes for uh, other people in my family becomes a secondary value. It's not as important as my being able to do what I feel personally I need to do to succeed, to feel good, to be effective in business. In American culture, individuality is a paramount value. United States, Australia, Britain, those are very individualistic cultures. People think happiness is the most important thing. Now, in, in China and Korea, they think happiness is important. They want happiness, but they don't want it more than anything else, whereas in the United States, they might say happiness is the most important thing. And what happens then is that people in, in the United States are not willing to make sacrifices. So if you say, uh, I want to I do something out of respect for my father versus this other thing that will make me happy, in America, more likely to choose the happy thing. Westerners are raised to be independent. Independent originally means not depending on someone else. Independent is the combination of the negative prefix in and a verb meaning to stick to. If you think about what is the life goal of an independent person, a person from an independent sort of culture or an individualistic culture, that life goal is to be self-reliant, capable of doing things on one's own. Um, smart and discerning and all of that uh, uh, is is fed by the notion that you need to present yourself as being overly smart uh, almost impossibly capable so almost a superman kind of view of the self building self-confidence is one of the most important things in american education the educational system in the U.S. and parents' responses to children in the U.S. encourage children to inflate themselves, to, um, to brag, to present themselves in a positive way, to say, I'm the greatest, I'm, I'm smart and I'm capable and I can do it. Westerners place a high value on statements like, I am confident in my judgment. I can tell when someone is lying. And many people think that I am special. Westerners score high on this scale, and they uh, tend to agree with statements like, um, I am very confident of my judgments, or I can always tell when someone is lying to me, or many people think that I am exceptional. Okay? Western individualists are more likely to agree with statements like that. In every society, there are expected behaviors which are considered socially desirable responding. In Eastern society, people who behave modestly are considered to be good people, whereas in Western society, people who look smart find approval. We all care about looking good to other people. We all want to present ourselves positively. But what that means can change from culture to culture. So in an, uh, uh, an Eastern culture, presenting yourself positively means I don't break the rules. I behave as I am expected to. I can be trusted to be a good friend or a good uh, person w for my group, helping people. Um, that's presenting yourself positively. Uh, uh, but in a Western culture, it's quite different. Presenting yourself positively means being smart 
and capable. I can do it. Uh, I'm smarter than the average person. I can be self-reliant. And so the Western way of being desirable and positive is to brag a little bit about my own personal qualities and how capable I am. But the Eastern way of being desirable is not to brag. It is, it's to be modest, but also to be following the rules and doing what is expected. Western parents teach their children to independently make judgments about things by themselves. I had a Japanese colleague who was staying in my house and visiting to give some lectures and he noticed that in the morning for my daughter's breakfast what I would do is put out on the counter three, four, five cereals and I would say to her okay what is it for breakfast today what do you choose do you want rice checks do you want Cheerios do you want Captain Crunch those were her favorite and then I would assume that of course she would enjoy get a lot of pleasure to choose her own her own cereal and my colleague um, at Shinobu Kitayama who I've um, done uh, a great deal of research with said to me one day why why do you give her those choices why and I thought it was a very strange question because it seemed obvious to me that everybody would want a choice and the reason you would want a choice is because you get to show what what you like what your preference is and you get to um, uh, show that you are independent um, you can have some control in your world even though my daughter was quite small at the time four years old I think I thought that she would really enjoy um, this choice because of her ability to express herself and show her uniqueness it's the cereal she likes it was different maybe from the cereal that her mom likes or her dad likes or her friend likes and and it was a strange question why but when I started to think about it I, I could see that there were many many cultural assumptions um, sort of a huge iceberg beneath this um, sort of small little tip of the behavior of, of, of choosing. And then I said, well, what do you do for your daughter? And then he said, well, you, we just give her Japanese breakfast. It's the breakfast that's good for kids. We give rice, some miso, sometimes some vegetables, sometimes some pickles, something like that. That's the good breakfast. That's what, what you do. In the East, mothers typically make choices for their kids. Children tend to believe that their mothers choose what's best for them. They trust and follow their mother's choices. Children are given small tests. What's being studied is the difference between when children choose questions and when the mothers do. Western children who chose their questions solved them better. So having somebody you know and care about make a choice for you is seen in a way as a negative, a source of extrinsic motivation of somebody external to the self telling you what you have to do. And European Americans experience, experience that as a negative phenomenon. I want to avoid that. I'd rather do it myself. I'd rather have the choice. But Eastern children whose mothers chose their questions solved them better. Our Asian American children didn't have that at all they found the experience more rewarding. They were more intrinsically motivated, and they learned better as a result. The standard for Westerners' judgment comes from inside. When evaluating themselves, Westerners tend to follow their own judgment regardless of what others say. 서양 사람들은 자기 행위의 기준이 자기 내부에 있습니다. 특히 자기의 감정이 있는 거죠. 그래서 내가 기분이 좋고 내가 끌리면 은 이거는 내가 행동을 하는데 충분히 정당하다. 그러니까 내 행동의 최종 정당성은 어디에 있느냐. 내가 그것에 대해서, 그것에 대해서 어떻게 느끼는가 하는 데 있는 거지만 동양 사람들은 자기 자신을 어떤 사회로부터 고립된 존재를 보지 않기 때문에 
내가 처해 있는 역할 또 규범 이런 것들로부터 자기 행위에 정당성이 온다고 우리가 믿는 거죠. 따라서 끊임없이 내 주변 사람들 혹은 어른들 내 상사들이 어떻게 보는가 하는 것이 내 행위의 정당성을 담보해 준다고 보기 때문에 끊임없이 자기를 비교하려고 하고 그 결과로 인해서 이것만이 다는 아니지만 동양 사람들과 서양 사람들 사이에서 경험하는 행복감에 있어서 좀 차이가 있는 거죠. 동양 사람들은 끊임없이 다른 사람의 관점에서 보기 때문에 개인의 행복이라는 것, 개인만의 행복이라는 걸 경험하기가 상대적으로 좀 불리하다고 할 수가 있습니다. Easterners evaluate themselves depending on the standards of others or the society. What others think of them is more important than their own evaluation. Thus, Easterners are typically very sensitive to others' judgment. This phenomenon that is so prominent in the consciousness of Easterners is called the generalized other. So the generalized other is um, my image of the other person. Uh, it doesn't have to be a specific other person. In fact, that's the whole concept of a generalized other, uh, which is um, how other people would think of me, how other people do think of me. Um, so, you know, I, there may be something that um, uh, I... don't want to do because I think the generalized other, I think other people would think ill of me. Uh, and this is sort of my, um, my representation of, uh, you know, this, this typical other person that uh, embodies the norms and the standards of my society. So, you know, every human being has a generalized other. Every human being has... Um, a view of, you know, some sort of other person looking at them. Um, it's a question of how omnipresent this other person is. Um, and, you know, it, it may be that this generalized other uh, is a much more salient part, is a much more important part of the consciousness of East Asians than it is for Euro-Americans. The picture of one's own self-image in the mind of others is the generalized other. This feature is analogous to when marbles contain images of other objects on themselves. One marble contains images of other objects in relation to itself. If you look closely at a marble on the intranet, you can see one marble contains many marbles. In Buddhism, this is called Il Chung Da Ta Jung Il, which means the parts belong to the whole, and the whole belongs to the parts. If you look closely at a leaf, you can find the entire figure of a tree in it. There are many such examples like this in nature. It is so widely accepted that in the East it is considered a law of nature. It is believed that every object in the universe moves according to this law of nature. The law of nature is applied to the human body. In so-called oriental medicine, the human body is compared to a small universe. According to oriental medicine, humans are healthy when they live according to the laws of nature. If they go against them, they come down with disease. This concept is called Chon In Sang Um. In Confucianism, people are taught to live by this rule. The teachings of Confucius focused heavily on how humans can live according to the law of nature. In the West,
last, however, the human mind has often been seen as superior to the laws of nature. That it is the mind that finds truth, not nature. Like in Western college, they always emphasize seminars, emphasizing debates. Why? Because it's coming from the uh, Greek traditions. Because the more you fight with each other, the more you debate with each other, the more likely you will find the truth. That's precisely what uh, Aristotle said. Truth is a property of the discourse. That's he said. What it means is that uh, truth is not in the book. Truth is not in your head. Truth is not in his head. Truth is in between. So we fight, we debate, we argue. Then we discover where the truth is. Is in the middle. From ancient times in the West, observation and analysis have developed for finding truths. This process makes it necessary for observers to present their findings and to allow others to search for fallacies and errors. Thus, the process of exchanging ideas and holding free discussion is required in order to find truth. In the West. Oratory has traditionally been highly regarded. This is why eloquence and rhetoric have developed into virtual art forms. Quite to the contrary, people who are eloquent are often not trusted in the East. Korean proverbs like "the empty carriage makes a lot of noise." You know, this idea that um, when you hear a lot of talking often means there's not so much so much thinking going on. Or in Japanese context, people say the mouth is the source of misfortune. So this idea that talking is not always thought to be a good thing, and being the person who knows is often the person who's quiet and doesn't have a lot to say. In the East, a negative image of eloquence has long existed. Easterners traditionally believe that language is a means for delivering meaning, so language can't be for some other purpose. The philosopher Zhuang Zhi spoke the phrase "tugi mang on," which says that if you understand something, then forget the words. Confucius himself referred to "onbul chini," which means that language can't hold every meaning in the world. There is a small experiment to test the correlation between language and thought. Simple puzzles are given to Easterners and Westerners. Sometimes they are told to describe their actions, and other times they are told to work silently. Now, this task was very easy for the American. With European background, who are used to thinking that talking and thinking go together, and if you, if you, if you are thinking, then you should know how to say it. So their performance was slightly better in the condition in which they were talking out loud than when they were silent. For the um, students with East Asian background, this was completely reversed, such that their performance was very good when they were. Silent when they said solved this, these set of tasks with no talking. 
when they were required to say what they were doing, so to say, um, let me think, now I need to find a square that has stripes and circle, that should be the next one. If they were allowed to say what, verbalize their mental processes, they did very poorly on, on, the, um, on this task. And so the talking interfered with their performance. For the Americans, talking actually enhanced their performance somewhat. And this is a clear, very carefully controlled study that shows that talking and thinking don't um, always go together for people who have been exposed to these other ideas about what is, um, what is good thinking. It doesn't often include talking. The operation in the mind and the language take place at the same time for Westerners. When they see a pipe, Westerners come up with the word pipe and recognize it. This principle of identity is a basic building block of Western logic. In I Ching, a book of Oriental philosophy, E refers to changes. The core of the book is about change and alteration. While the basic philosophy of the West is the principle of identity, the basic philosophy of the East is the principle of change. Kumgangsan, Korea's most famous mountain, has four different names. It is just one mountain, but it has a different name for each season. In the spring, it is Kumgangsan. In the summer, it is Pongnesan. In the fall, it is Pungaksan. And in the winter, it is Kegolsan. One mountain having four different names may be confusing to Westerners, who are familiar with the principle of identity. This is Sehando, considered a national treasure in Korea. There is something odd about this picture. The thickness of the door is portrayed in an opposite way. In Western paintings, the painters paint objects right in front of them. Painters visit places where objects are located and paint them. In Eastern painting, painters put emphasis on the window of their mind. They picture objects in their mind first. Then, when they return home, they retrieve the images in their mind and paint in their room. The famous Chinese painter and poet Su Dongpo taught that in order to paint bamboo, one must put bamboo in one's mind. This concept is called Hyung Jung Song Juk, meaning bamboos are completed in the mind. When the mind of a painter is like the marble, the bamboo can stay in it. The bamboo reflected in the marble suggests that the observer and the objects are one in the mind. In this oneness, the distinction between front and back, or right and left, is meaningless. Because what I see becomes one with me. The clearer marbles are able to contain objects better. This is why in Eastern culture, the expression, the mind should be clear, is used a lot. The clearer mind is able to become one with objects. 
finding truth in Eastern thought is accomplished not through discussion, but through meditation, making one's mind clear and still. In American context, if you say, make your mind clear or still, uh, still, still as water, which is many people, for example, if you take any martial arts or anything like that, you know this idea that the mind should be clear and still. That's the best way for concentration and meditative state. Often for Americans, that seems like the mind is blank. And that's very terrifying to think <laughs> that the mind would be blank. So all the time they're talking and thinking, having a conversation with themselves. And so it's, it's hard for Americans often to do the other task of um, making their mind still. To, uh, it's hard to be in a receptive state. So they have trouble with those kinds of tasks. As we have seen, Westerners and Easterners typically see objects in different ways. Westerners try to understand by analyzing object. And Easterners try to become one with them. This is why we say, Westerners want to see, and Easterners want to be.